Hello, my family and friends. I am so glad to see everybody once again on this Lord's Day's broadcast of Victory Bible Fellowship on Facebook Live. And by the way, you are all my friends. Even if I've never met you, you are still my friend. I am a big believer in that old adage that says that a stranger is just a friend that I haven't met yet. So I welcome everybody here this morning. I am Pastor Ray Jellich, for those of you who don't know me, and I have the joy and privilege of serving as the pastor of Victory Bible Fellowship. I want to tell you about two new things that I'm going to do. I don't know how often I'm going to do them, if I'm going to do them every Sunday or just sometimes, but two new things that we've got going on. First of all, in the comments section of every video sermon, I am going to put, at least from time to time, my sermon notes. This way you can have all the scriptures and points and everything uh, that you can, you know, copy and paste it, print it out, you know, do whatever you believe God leads you to do with it so that this way you can even in, uh, further increase your knowledge of God's word and grow closer and closer to him in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's one new feature. A second new feature that, again, I don't know if I'm going to, be, I'm going to do it every Sunday or not, is worship music. For a long time, I was struggling with, I'd like to add worship music to what we're doing. How do I get that done? And then this afternoon, it dawned on me. I was watching a beautiful rendition of that great old hymn, We're Marching to Zion. It was a YouTube video uh, done by the Gaithers. And at the end of the sermon, again, in the comments section, I am going to post a link to that YouTube video and I will be doing that at least from time to time, if not more often, posting video links to uh, beautiful worship music. Today, instead of having a shout out, we're going to have a remembrance. Because today, December 6th, is the 6th anniversary of the death of my father. He is with the Lord right now. He is in heaven. He is uh, having the time of his eternal life, we might say, right now. My father was a great man. He was highly esteemed uh, both by me individually and everybody else uh, in my family. And uh, I want to once again express my deepest sympathies to my mother because out of everybody in the family, I think she's the one, obviously, who feels this loss the most. Mom, uh, I love you. And uh, you're in my thoughts. You're in my prayers. And actually, in just a few minutes, we're going to be talking a little bit more about my beloved dad. But our text today is found in 1 John chapter 5 and verses 5 through 13. 1 John chapter 5 and verses 5 through 13. And I would kindly ask, to open up your Bibles right now to that passage, 1 John chapter 5 and verses 5 through 13. 
And this is another one of those times when we're going to see a very simple and yet very profound and important truth. And it's this, your salvation is eternally secure. If you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then your salvation is eternally secure. Let's go before God in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us out of your word right now. Because we're going through a time in our country where so many things are not secure. There's so much instability. There's so much death with COVID-19. Oh God, we ask that you would enable us to put those things aside right now and to focus in on what you want to teach us out of your word that even if everything else is insecure, our salvation is indeed eternally secure if we have put our faith and trust in you, Lord Jesus. And so quiet our hearts, Lord, if there's any sin in our lives, sin that would prevent us from hearing from you, we confess it to you right now. We ask for your forgiveness from it. We repent of it. We turn away from it. And we turn back to you by faith right now so that we can hear from you, O oh God. And Lord, we also pray that if there's somebody who is watching this video who is not yet saved, that today would be the day that they get saved. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. If you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then according to this text and others, your salvation is eternally secure. This doctrine goes by several names. One is the doctrine of eternal security. Another is the preservation of the saints. A third is the perseverance of the saints. And there may be even others. And all of those things point to the fact that security is a human need. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Some years ago, there was a famous psychologist by the name of Dr. Abraham Maslow. And Maslow did a lot of research on human emotions, human development, uh, human psychology. And one thing that he came up with, he came up with something that we call the um, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And there are five needs in that hierarchy of needs. And one of those needs is security, is safety. And Maslow did his research, listen to this, he did his research during the dark, violent, bloody days of the Second World War. In other words, he looked around him and he saw this war going on in which millions of people worldwide were being slaughtered. People were being slaughtered in mass in Europe. People were being slaughtered in mass in Asia. People were being slaughtered in mass in the Pacific Islands. And not only that, 
but people from the United States were contributing troops to the effort, and they were getting killed. And people from Canada were contributing troops. Uh, Canada was contributing troops to the war effort, and they were getting killed. And Australia was contributing troops to the war effort, and they were getting uh, killed. And many people from the West Indies joined the British Army, and they were getting killed. And so in many places, even places where there weren't battles, people were getting killed. In fact, if I remember correctly, upwards of 70 million people or maybe more, I don't know. I don't remember what the exact figure is, but it's an astronomical number. Got killed during the Second World War. And Maslow took a look at this and just observed the obvious. What we really know to be true is that people need safety and security. It is a human need. It is a need that I would say is a God-given need that God has placed upon all of us. One of these people who was affected by the human need of security, of safety, as it was emphasized by the deprivation of that during the Second World War, was my father. My father was a war refugee. My father grew up on an island that at the time that he was born was under the dictatorship of Benito Mussolini. And so he had to endure that. And then uh, when World War II uh, ended, without going into a whole lot of details, the communists of Yugoslavia were coming down, and they were about to take over the island on which my dad was born and raised and on which he lived. And he was 20 years old at this time, and this is what he told me. He told me that his parents and the other elders uh, of his town approached him and pr approached other young people, and they said to my, my dad, John, you're a young man. The communists are coming down. They will take over this island. We already went through one dictatorship, the dictatorship of Benito Mussolini. You're a young person. You have a chance to get out. They, the communists are going to bring a second dictatorship upon us. Get out now while you can. And so my dad did just that, having this need, knowing this need, feeling this need for safety and security. He fled the very island where he was born and he was raised. He was forced to leave everybody and everything that he knew and that he held precious and that he held dear. First, he went to Italy. He lived with relatives there for a few years. And then, thank God, he was welcomed in as a refugee to our great United States of America. But we see that security is a human, God-given need. And listen to this. It's not only that way with the physical, but we're also going to see that same thing with the spiritual. Let me tell you this. Christian, God does not want to have you dangling. Maybe you're saved, maybe you're not saved. You know, uh, uh, maybe you're going to go to heaven, maybe you're going to go to hell. 
maybe you can uh, lose your salvation. God doesn't want you to have any of that kind of uncertainty. And so, as we're going to see now, as we get into this text, that he tells us plainly, flatly, securely, we might say, that if we have put our faith and trust in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have eternal life, that he has given it to us, and that we can never lose it. Your salvation, Christian, is eternally secure. Let me read the text that we have in front of us. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. Christian, this text firmly teaches us that your salvation is eternally secure. Why is this such a great biblical doctrine? And why is it rather so important for us to emphasize today? Plainly, listen to this, because many Christians actually believe erroneously and falsely teach that you can lose your salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about and what I see, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody or offend anybody or put anybody down, but it really is absurd, the notion that you could lose your salvation. I remember one time I was visiting a church in which they believed and they taught that they could lose their salvation. And the pastor was standing up 
and he said to everybody, does anybody have a word of blessing or word of encouragement or some way in which God blessed you this week? And a woman stood up and she was praising God ostensibly for the fact that this past week she got saved for the tenth time. I, I, I mean, let, 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 me, let me tell you something. God, God doesn't want you to feel like you're a yo-yo on a string. You know, where you're going up and down, up and down, up and down. One day you're saved, the next day you're not saved. The day after that you're saved again. The day after that. You lost your salvation again, and you constantly are trying to reclaim or regain your salvation. God doesn't want you on that kind of a spiritual yo-yo or spiritual roller coaster. You're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. In fact, the Bible tells us in this text and in another one that we're going to see in a little while, it tells us in no insert, uncertain rather terms that losing our salvation is impossible. In fact, the Bible has many words in it that uh, convey complete certainty, complete assurance. And in this text that we just read, we find not one of them, but two of them. The first word is the word has or have. And we see that in verses 10 through 13. We're going to see that in greater detail in just a few minutes. We see the word has or have. I want you to listen for those words. The second word is the word no. You see that in verse 13. It's not iffy. It's not maybe, or I hope, or it's nothing wishy-washy like that. It's that you know that you have eternal life. And what is the basis of all this? Well, first of all, I want you to see in verses 5 through 8 that the foundation of your faith, listen to this, is not just in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, but is in fact in the Holy Trinity, in our triune God. First, we have the Spirit mentioned here in verses 6 through 8, where it says uh, in verse 6, this is the one who came by Water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, who testifies. And look at this, because the Spirit is the truth. So what we're talking about here is truth, hard truth, truth you can trust, truth you can rely on, truth on which you can count for your eternal destiny, truth that is a foundation that is never going to be moved. It is rock solid truth testified to by the third person of the Holy Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. But there's also here a reference to the second person of the Holy Trinity. Or rather, I should say the third person of the Holy Trinity. I'll deal with that first. The water. When it says the water here, and you see that again in verses 6, and also in verse 8, it is a reference to the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember that baptism? 
The Bible says that John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he pulled the Lord Jesus Christ up out of the water, the Word of God tells us that a voice came out of heaven, God the Father, and God the Father spoke the following words. He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I was well pleased, listen to him. Let me tell you what was happening there. This is something that any person who lived in the days of the Roman Empire would clearly recognize and understand. The Romans had a custom that, uh, especially if they were from a well-to-do prominent family, that a father, when his son became of age, held a public legal ceremony. In fact, many times it was held in front of courthouses, outside in front of courthouses, in which he would publicly declare his son to be his son. And when he did this, it meant that he conferred upon his son all of the father's authority. In other words, that the son had the same authority as the father and that people were to honor and respect that son just as much as they do the father. And so here you have God the Father performing the same kind of ceremony. And he's testifying about his own son, that his son has the same authority as him and is just as much God as he is and that we human beings better listen to the Son. That's what God the Father was doing when he made that declaration when John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's where this word water comes from. It's an indirect reference, but a clear one, to God the Father. And then we have the second person of the Holy Trinity indirectly referenced to here by the word blood. This word blood occurs in verses 6 and 8. And of course, it is a reference to when the Lord Jesus Christ bled to death on Calvary's cross and did that for your sins and mine. And so, look at verse 8. This is kind of a focal point here, or verse 7, rather, and then going into verse 8. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, again, that is God, the Holy Spirit, and the water, again, that is God, the the Father, and the blood, again, that is God, the Holy Spirit, or, or rather, uh, God, uh, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are teaming up, and it says, point blank, that they are in agreement. In case you didn't know that, they're, they're always in agreement. They always have been in agreement, they always are in, in agreement, and they always will be in agreement. But it says it said it's it says that here in order to emphasize again the certainty, the surety of their testimony that God has given you eternal life, and that He's never going to take, take it away from you, and you are never going to lose it. We see that emphasized in verses 9 through 12, stemming 
from the triune God is his testimony that he has indeed given you eternal life. First of all, we see that the testimony of God is not like the testimony of men. And we receive the testimony of men. You know, many times in courtroom situations, we will see people, men, human beings, in other words, get up and testify, and we believe their testimony. It is a key part in either uh, convicting somebody or exonerating somebody. We put a, uh, 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 we hold the testimony of somebody in court, the testimony of a human being, we hold it up very, very highly, so highly that if they uh, 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 perjure themselves, we have a crime for that. It's called a perjury. And people get sent to prison for perjury, for lying. Men do lie. People do lie. And so the testimony of God is not like the testimony of man. Because in courtroom situations, there have been times when people have, have lied on the stand and either the uh, an innocent person got wrongly convicted or a guilty person got wrongly exonerated. But the Bible says plainly that God is not a man that he should lie. We saw a few minutes ago that word truth and that everything that comes out of the mouth of God is 100% pure truth. If we rely on the testimony of human beings as we do, how much more so can we and should we rely on the testimony of God? And the testimony of God is this. He's given you eternal life. You're never going to lose it. Look at what it says. Yeah, going on in verse 9. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. There we see one of the two words of certainty that we noted before, the word has. Not maybe has, not it's possible that he has, but flatly, point blank, that person has it, has that eternal life. And has it so much so that it's spoken of here as the testimony is in him. In other words, the testimony that God has given you eternal life, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, that testimony is so much in you that it's almost like a physical organ that is in you. Nobody can reach inside of you and pull out your heart or pull out a lung or pull out your stomach or anything like that, right? Nobody can do that. You know, not without killing you, in the same way. The testimony of God that He has given you eternal life through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in you spiritually and cannot be lost or stolen or somehow dropped can in no way be taken away from you. As a matter of fact, the person, it says, who does not believe these things, who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has not put their faith and trust in Christ, even though God has said plainly again and again that I sent my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins and to be raised from the dead to give you a new life, a new life in which you can be 100% certain of your salvation. There are people out there who will not believe it. God says here, that they make him out to be a liar. Not that God lies. But deep down inside their hearts, again, not that God is a liar himself, but deep down inside their hearts, by their uh, 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 unbelief, by their rejection of Christ, they accuse God of being a liar. Why? Because that person, it says at the end of verse 10, has not believed in the testimony, the solid, completely, purely truthful testimony that God has given concerning his son. And it goes even deeper than that. This is the testimony. This is the brass tax of it, what it comes down to. Verse 11. Here we see that has again, that certainty again. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. And so you see that a person is only in one of two categories. They either have the Son of God, they either have eternal life, or they do not have the Son of God, and they do not have eternal life. There is no in-between. There's no going back and forth. There's no one day you have eternal life, the next day you don't. There's no being on a yo-yo where you're down one day, you don't have eternal life, you're pulled back up the next day, now you have eternal life. There's no spiritual roller coaster ride where one day you're up on top and you have eternal life. The next day you're plunged all the way down and you don't have eternal life. There's none of that. You either have it or you don't have it. If you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And you cannot lose it. And the devil can't steal it from you. But if you don't have the Son of God, if you have never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you do not have eternal life. Rather, what you have is eternal death. And, 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 and that's really not so much a future thing. It's a present thing. Because the word of God says that if you don't have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as your Savior and Lord, then you stand condemned already. You stand condemned right now. You are in the position of the damned, and you need to be moved from the position of the damned to the position of those who have eternal life. You are dead, the Bible says, in your trespasses and sins if you have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not sick in your trespasses and sins. You're not dying uh, from your trespasses and sins. You are dead, dead dead in your trespasses and sins. But the good news is that Jesus Christ can take you from being dead and resurrect you spiritually so that you have life 
spiritual life, everlasting life, eternal life. As a matter of fact, it says here in verse 13 that the whole reason that John wrote this book is that so that you can know there's that second word of confidence, that second word of certainty, that second word of assurance that you can know, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, that you have eternal life. No having it today, losing it tomorrow. None of that. No, no, no. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. When it says there the name, it means all that Jesus is, you've put your faith and trust in him so that you may know that you have eternal life. I was planning on getting into John chapter 10 and verses 27 through 30. Uh, we won't do that now for lack of time, but maybe we'll do that next Sunday. I'm not sure. But read that scripture as well, because there you're going to see that you're in God the Father's hands, and you're in God the Son's hands, and you are in good hands. You are in eternal hands, and you can never get out of those hands or lose your salvation. And so the question is today, have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't done so, I urge you to do it right now. Don't put it off. Tomorrow could be too late. You could get hit by a car or have a heart attack and right away you would drop dead and you'd be called to account before God. Are you ready to answer before him? If you're not ready, then you need to get ready and you need to get ready right now. All you've got to do is acknowledge that you're a sinner and acknowledge that the uh, uh, that your sins have made a separation where right now, as you stand, you're condemned, you're damned. They've made a separation between you and God and that that separation threatens to become permanent where you get dropped into that place of eternal damnation, hell, if you do not put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the good news is that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he went to that cross for you and that he paid the price for your sins on that cross for you. And all you've got to do is confess your sins unto him. Ask him for forgiveness. Repent of your sins. Simple word. All it means is you turn away from your sins and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And he was raised from the dead to give you a new life, to give you a life in which you can know assuredly, know securely that you have eternal life. Put your faith and your trust in him right now. Family and friends, I want to thank you once again for tuning in to this Lord's Day's broadcast of Victory Bible Fellowship on Facebook Live. If you were blessed by this sermon, I want to encourage you to hit that like button. I want to encourage you to share this video with other family members and friends. Email it to them. Text it to them. Post it on other social media websites. I also want to encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Raymond Jellich, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D-J-E-L-I-C-H, no spaces. I also want you, I want to encourage you to invite other family members and friends to tune in next Sunday because we're going to be doing this same thing again next Sunday as well. Let's go before God in prayer right now. Lord God, thank you for speaking to us out of your word. Thank you for answering our prayer before because we prayed for that. And Lord God, I pray 
that if there's somebody here right now who is not yet saved, that they would get saved right now. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I love you all. Bye-bye. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday on Victory Bible Fellowship's Facebook Live broadcast. Bye-bye.